place in the name of Jesus. I release the power of God to work miracles in this place. I release the power of God in this place to perform miracles, to touch hearts and lives, to brand up the captive old and loosen in the name of Jesus. I release the angels of God to minister to every need of every saint in this place. I call down every stronghold of the enemy in the name of the Lord. It has to come down. It has to come down. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I come with my worship today. I come with my worship. I come with my worship. I've got the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. We're going to have a breakthrough in the name of Jesus. We're releasing the fire of the Holy Ghost in this place. Every visitor be touched. Every person be revived in their spirit today. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's magnify the Lord. Pastor always said if you feel heaviness when you begin to enter this place and pray, it's because you're carrying this service forward. But what you need to do right now is join your voice with your hand clap and join your voice with your praise and join your voice with your worship and let's exalt the name of the Lord in this place. Come on, let's keep that going. Let's keep it going. I need some help, some prayer warriors today. Lift your voice to the Lord. Just begin to praise the Lord. Just begin to praise the Lord. Come on, let's praise him today. He shut the Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Your breakthroughs in this service. Your miracles in this service. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. The Bible says enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his course with praise. When we begin to do that right now, let's just thank the Lord. Let's give him praise. Let's give him the glory as we sing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
begin to lift your voice and magnify God right now. Oh Lord, it's all for your glory. It's all for your glory. Jesus, I'm going to use my hands for your glory. I'm going to use my feet for your glory. I'm going to use my voice for your glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You're worthy of it all, Jesus. You're worthy of it all, Lord. We praise you today. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You may be seated. Christian Life Center has a few announcements. Community prayers on Saturdays between 6 and 8 p.m. You can come anytime between those times. We have kids' prayer in the Sunday school room from 6.30 to 7 p.m. We have an Arise preteen event this Saturday, January 8th. It's going to be from 4.30 to 6 p.m. There's going to be a time of fun, fellowship, and Bible study. It's going to be for ages 10 to 12. If you have any questions, please contact Haley Elmer, our brother Sam Silva here. Firm Foundations class is every Sunday at 9 a.m. This is our new members discipleship class. It's a 12-week class until March 27th. All are welcome, especially if you are new to our church. You can see our pastor, Pastor Joe over there, if you're interested in joining. We have Elevate Focus Night this Friday, January 14th. At 7 p.m., there's going to be games, snacks, worship, and Bible study. Our speaker is going to be Brother Austin Osborne. It's going to be located in our youth room in the back there. If you have any questions, you can contact the Osbournes here behind me. I want to welcome all of our guests, first of all. <laughs> welcome to Christian Life Center this morning. We're so glad to have you. We're about to worship God through giving. If the ushers could come at this time, that's a celebration. We're glad to give. We're cheerful givers. Amen. I want to remind you that there are four ways to give. We have the Tithely app that you can download to your phone. Very easy to use. The text to give. The envelope and the offering plate. And also our kiosk in the back. Let's do our offering decree. Thou shalt also decree a thing and it shall be established unto thee, and the light shall shine upon thy ways. I am a cheerful giver. Today I cheerfully put your tithe to put into your storehouse. I cheerfully give my normal offering to you. I cheerfully give my extra building fund offering according to the pledge I made to you. Therefore the enemy is rebuked and every curse is broken. Upon the authority of your word, I have given, and it shall be given to me. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. You will pour upon me such blessings that there is not room enough to receive it. I receive your blessings in my family, in my finances, in my body, and in my spirit. All that I do will prosper according to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you. Hallelujah. Let's continue to worship the Lord together as we sing. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Bag of bones, and 
I tried with all my might, but I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting. This bag of bones, and just when. Get 
up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Because he picked me up, turned me around, he placed my feet on solid ground. I thank the master, I thank the savior, because he healed my heart, he changed my name, forever free. I'm not the same. I thank the master, I thank the savior. God, let's thank the Lord right now. If God's ever done anything for you that's worth a hand clap, that's worth a hallelujah, why don't you do it right now? We praise you, Jesus. Thank you for bringing us out of, out of that grave of sin. Thank you for changing our hearts. Thank you for giving us a new name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Woo, hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You may be seated. We are so thankful for the presence of the Lord in this service this morning. Anybody feel the touch of God here today? Feels so good. I'm Pastor Joe. I welcome you to Christian Life Center. And uh, this is a Pentecostal church. That's why you see people clapping. Uh, some people are dancing. Uh, there may be people talking in languages you don't understand. And if you're wondering about what's going on, this is all done in the book of the Acts of the Apostles in the New Testament. We are a book of Acts church, and uh, we worship God extravagantly because he has done extravagant things for us. He set us free. He set us free. Praise God. I have some certificates to give out. I think most of these people are in Sunday school, so if there's any relations that are here, you can come up and get them. We have a baptismal certificate for Javon Blackwelder. We're so thankful he got baptized in Jesus' name. We have a Holy Ghost certificate for Isabella Camp Campatella. Oh, that's my daughter. That's right. <laughs> Isabella Campatella. I'll keep this one, I guess. Is she here? Oh, my goodness. Here it is. <laughs> Praise God. And then Jada Lindo also received the gift of the Holy Ghost. We're so thankful. Bless you. We've got more to give out. We've got a new batch of certificates. Uh, so make sure you're here tonight. We'll give the rest out tonight. People that have been baptized filled with the Holy Ghost. I do want to say something. It's so good to see Brother Steve Nurse today. <laughs> love him so much and our prayers are with him and his family during this time and this Thursday at one o'clock at Loman's funeral home right across the street is the home going service of Sister Tara Nurse and so if you can make it that would be great one o'clock this Thursday and of course we'll post this as well on our Facebook page and put it in the announcements it's one o'clock this Thursday the home going service of Sister Tara Nurse praise God we had a, uh, our first Firm Foundations class this morning for this semester. And I think there was 19 people, if I counted correctly, somewhere 18 or 19 people. And uh, great questions going on. It's an awesome time of discipleship where you can just ask uh, about the scriptures. And this will be going on for the next 11 weeks. This was the first day. It's a 12-week series. And this will be going on for the next 11 weeks. Uh, we'll be talking about the Word of God, the foundational principles in the Word of God. And so if you are new to Christian Life Center and you would like to join that time, we had uh, fruit plates today and, and water. And that's suffering because we're all on a Daniel's fast. But in a few weeks, we're going to have donuts and coffee. We cannot wait for such wonderful, glorious things to happen. Uh, but if you, if you would like to join, you can just show up to next Sunday morning at 9 a.m., and uh, you will enjoy that very much. It'll be very beneficial to your walk with God. Praise God. And, and the thing about this series is it's not cumulative. Each, each uh, lesson is its own standalone lesson. And so you can hop in whenever you want and you, you haven't missed anything. And uh, we'll give you the other stuff for homework. You'll get extra credit. Praise God. I thought that would be funny. Obviously, that was not funny. We'll move on. 
We are so delighted this weekend to have the Brown family with us, Brother Mark and Sister Jordan Brown. Uh, if you were here last night at community prayer, my God have mercy. The power and the glory of God hit this place last night. And I'm so thankful for the word that we heard. Uh, Brother Brown is the district superintendent of the state of South Dakota. And he has been pastoring there for many years and now is leading a new initiative in our entire movement and is a mighty man of God. Uh, he's my friend. He is anointed and he is trusted throughout our movement. And he always has a fresh word from the Lord. And we are thankful, thankful, thankful that he and his family could be with us this weekend. Why don't we thank God? Why don't we stand and praise the Lord as Brother Brown comes and takes his liberty in this place? Praise the Lord, everybody. Siéntete por favor en la presencia de Dios. Amen. Or you may be squatted in American. And uh, you all can be seated. It's good to be in the house of the Lord with the people of God. It is a privilege. It is an honor for me to be here with this family of God. Last time I was here, it was Pentecost Sunday. And um, we were in the other building. You know, it was like a, like a YMCA, right? Or, or I don't know what the building was. It was like a, a, like a community center. There we go. And uh, Pastor Campitella took me by here to kind of just show me the vision and preparation of what you guys were doing. And man, less than a year, you all have been busy little bees. I mean, this is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful sanctuary walk through the classrooms I I, I did the, the five cent tour last night after service and, and pastor took me to every single Sunday school mansion like every classroom is a mansion for children and uh, you, this, you guys are blessed you are so so blessed so blessed I, I'm good I'm good thank you and uh, we um we, uh, my, my, my wife and I, we absolutely love your pastor and his wife. And um, I didn't know if they thought I was going to sing. I don't sing, so um, musicians can be dismissed. <laughs> you don't want to hear none of that. But um, your pastor is amazing. And, um, you know, it's, sometimes we can very casually say I love you. I think it's very good to say I love you, um, but I genuinely love your pastor. And sometimes you, the saying goes, you don't know how, you know what you have till you, you lose it. I, I hope it doesn't take that for you to realize what you have. And for those who are maybe newer uh, or just visiting your guests, and we're glad to have you here today. I just want you to know that you are in the presence of a, a healthy church, healthy leadership. Uh, a good church is hard to find these days. A lot of charlatans, a lot of reprobates, a lot of selfish people, self-absorbed people, people that are in it for money. It's, that's a reality of the day that we live in. There's corruption out there. And so you should be selective about where you're going to attend you should be careful about where you're going to be exposing your heart and your spirit and your children to. But if you're here today, you're church shopping, hip and hopping, flipping and flopping, it's time to best be stopping. This is a great <laughs> church for you to be a part of. It's a great church. And I can never say thank you enough to Pastor Campatel and his wife. They have tremendously impacted my life. They've, they've, they've helped change me. They've helped form me. And um, I'm, I, I, I could spend the rest of this morning just saying thank you to him. And I think it would be worthy of it because the Bible says to give honor to where honor is due. But the things that he has spoken to my life, seeing Jesus for yourself, I want to step out of the boat, the six battles of David. I go on and on about I, I've, I've, I've followed your pastor's voice for many years, 
listening. And he's been to South Dakota and he's ministered to the Jesus Church in South Dakota. And where we are today, there is a huge fingerprint of his ministry upon our church because countless times the saints of the church have went back to the teachings that he brought to our congregation. And um, I'm thankful. I'm thankful. I rarely miss a Sunday, but I'm glad to miss any Sunday to be with you guys because your leadership, your covering is amazing. Amazing. I love the Campatellas very much. If you have a picture of my family, I'd love just to introduce my children in the classroom. I want to say thank you to this church for allowing my my wife and my children to come. And uh, I love my wife. This past December 17th, we've been married 17 years. And uh, yeah. And my three children, Noah, Grace, and Eden, I love them very much. They're in uh, classrooms right now. They're 11, 9, and 6. And then that little uh, rat right there, um, his, we, we call him Stimmy, short for stimulus. I just want to thank the government for buying us a dog. And um, so I give honor to Grandpa Joe. So. Amen. I think there's another picture up there. You got negative 16. Is that on there? This is when I left home to come here. So I know you guys have been cold in your winter here. I, I, I really, I pray global warming, the prophecies of it come to pass in South Dakota. Because like when America goes under, like I'm going to have beachfront property in South Dakota. And it'll be 60 degrees year round, so... You guys are the ones that get the brunt of it. But, uh, yeah, so there's like a 90-degree swing coming here. Uh, we go back home, it'll be negative 3. But it'll warm up to 30 degrees midweek next week, so I thank God for that. Uh, if you have your Bibles, we're going to go to the book of John, chapter 9. Congregation, I need you to do something. I need you to bother your pastor as much as possible to bring me here every January and February to preach, and um, if he doesn't do it, it's because you all don't love God. <laughs> John chapter 9, verse 1 through 11, I'm going to preach something that anything I preach, it, it was birthed in South Dakota on the front lines. I feel I have a word from the Lord for this congregation that does not just apply to our local assembly, but I believe God wants to speak it to this assembly. And uh, I, I just ask that you would lean in. The best way to get God's attention is to give him your attention. Give God your undivided attention. If you struggle with checking your phone during service, just, just turn it off. Uh, you can survive for one hour. Just, just plug in. I'm not rebuking you. I'm not chastising you. I'm just encouraging you. To make the most, you've already made the effort to get up and to come out here. So make the most of it while you are here. God has something for you. And I believe the Lord has given me a healing word for you today. John chapter 9, verses 1 through 11. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man that was blind from his birth. His disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born Blind. It was a common myth, an urban legend, whatever you want to call it, that if somebody had some sort of handicap or they had some sort of struggle in life, it was because they had sin in their life. And that concept, you know, 2,000 year years ago, we're not too far removed. We still kind of think in those terms. Oh, man, I wonder what's wrong with them in their heart if this is unfolding in their life. And so Jesus debunks this. He says, neither has this man sinned nor his parents. He's not saying that they are sinless. He's just saying the cause of this is not from their sin. But this is that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light 
of the world. When he had thus spoken, he spat. Someone say he spit. He spit on the ground and made clay of spittle, not skittle. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay, and he said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which by interpretation means sent. He went his way, therefore, he washed, and he came seeing. The neighbors, therefore, and they which before had seen him that he was blind, said, Is, Isn't this the guy? That was blind. Isn't this the guy that sat and begged? Some said, it's him. Others said, well, it looks like him. But this man replied, I am him. Therefore, they said to him, how in the ever-loving world were your eyes open? How did this happen? And he said, a man that is called Jesus made clay, anointed my eyes. He said to me, go to the pool of Siloam. I washed, I went and washed, and I received sight. I want to speak to you just for the next few moments about when God spits in your face. When God spits in your face. Can we pray together? God, I love you. I thank you for the privilege, the honor, the opportunity to be gathered together with the saints of the Most High here in Palm Coast, Florida, God. I do not believe in coincidence. I do not believe in chance. Lord, I don't believe in some sort of random occurrence. I believe, Lord, that you have ordered this. I believe every single person in this room under the sound of my voice that you have divinely ordered this moment. And I pray, God, that our flesh does not interfere with your will. I pray we surrender to you and that your kingdom would come and that your will would be done. Open up the windows of heaven and roll back the roof of this church. Fixate a ladder between heaven and earth and I pray the angels of God would ascend and descend upon this people and may your divine presence itself walk up and down these aisles and I pray God that you would release your will your spirit into this place can we lift our voices can we lift our voices in the name of Jesus God we ask it in the name of Jesus we need it God let it be so today God we love you Jesus we are hungry we are thirsty after your righteousness I pray someone would be filled today would you clap your hands to the Lord Before you are seated, turn to somebody, smile real big, extend your hand to shake their hand, and say, <clears throat> and then you may be seated. <laughs> when God spits in your face, I don't know what your Bible reading life is like, but me, I have, uh, I've, I've struggled to read the Bible. It took a long time before I could break through to read it. I, uh, 10 times out of 10, I'm the dumbest man in the room, and to let something go before my eyes to read, it's a little difficult, but I've learned to pray Psalm 119 and verse 18 where he says, Open thou my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. If you struggle receiving from the word of God, ask him to give you sight and a passion and a love for the word. If you have a desire, it is the will of God for you to glean something from his word. And the way God helps me to understand things is I have to immerse myself in the story and every now and again when I read something, I do a double take, and it just kind of catches me by surprise because there's just some things that are just interesting or unique or distinct. They stand out in a different manner. And what we just read here in John chapter 9 is one of those occasions because it's not the fact that Jesus performed a miracle because you read many miracles of Jesus performed in the word of the Lord but it, it's not too often you read about the Messiah spitting to heal somebody. That catches my attention. And for a few reasons, one, spitting is one of the most unsanitary things that you can do. You know, I, I, I don't know if uh, you understand this, but you, you have germs inside of your mouth. 
And when it comes to cold season, when you sneeze, you don't go, ah, who? You go, ah. You sneeze into your elbow because spitting is unsanitary. You guys have hospitals in Palm Coast. I know it's a little different than South Dakota. And so we, when you go to a hospital, and it's not just hospitals now, it's everywhere, they have these things called sanitation stations. You walk by them and you place your hand under there and dispenses that 99.9% that disinfectant into your hands, you rub it. It's the reason why it is a machine with that substance in there. It's not a person that you walk up to and poke in the belly button so they go. <clears throat> <laughs> Spitting spreads germs. Saliva is disgusting. Not only is it unmannered or unsanitary, it is poor manners. If you are here today and you're single and ready to mingle and there's a lady that catches your room or your eye in this room, you wouldn't want to walk up to her and say, how you doing? I mean, it, it, she's going to walk. She's going to be disgusted and walk away. Now, if she stays, you found an interesting lady. And I use that word loosely now. It's disgusting. It's insulting. Has anyone ever had someone literally spit on you? I mean, just a little insight and revelation. They weren't paying you homage. They were ticked off at you. They were mad at you. And that was the greatest insult they could put upon you is by spitting. It was a humiliating gesture. In fact, as we're reading about this story in the New Testament of spit, it's actually recorded in your Old Testament. God took time to make a law about spit. You know that? You know that boring stuff you read in the book of Leviticus and Deuteronomy? God took time to make laws about your saliva. It's in the book. You know, before COVID happened and, you know, science discovered 14-day quarantine, the Bible spoke about 7- and 14-day quarantine. Just to confirm that before science, well, science is just catching up with God. Real science, legit science. But the Bible said, if someone spit on you, you could not go to the house of God for seven days. So it's like, you know, like you see someone here, you're like, man, I don't want to see them next Sunday. And you don't have to worry about seeing them next Sunday, you know? But we live in grace, so now we got to put up with each other, you know? It's a little different, higher level of expectation. Spit was used upon Jesus. In Matthew chapter 26, when they had this illegal trial with Jesus and they wanted to insult him after they began to falsely accuse him of being guilty, they blindfolded him. They began to slap him across the face and say, prophesy unto us. If you really be the son of God, why don't you declare who it is that slapped you while you're blindfolded if you really think you're some sort of supernatural person? And they began to spit upon the face of Jesus. Now, Jesus could have called them out. He could have, because he saw past that veil over his eyes. And he could have said, your name is Mark Brown in Watertown. You're four foot nothing. You live on 903 Second Street North. He could have read every little detail about their life. But the Bible says, as a sheep was before its shearer, he remained dumb. He remained silent and did not retaliate. Because if he would retaliate, there would never be a remission of sins. It was love that caused him to withhold a retaliation. Because he wanted there to be a day where there would be remission in the name of Jesus. Because of his death and his burial and his resurrection. I'm thankful that we serve a loving God. Would you clap your hands? Someone say, thank you, Jesus. But you see, man spitting on you is not the same as God spitting on you. I'd rather have God spit on me than man. Because my worst moment with God still far surpasses my best moment with man in this world. When we look here in the story of John chapter 9, 
as we revisit it and walk through it. We see the story unfold. This miracle occurs. It's pretty amazing. And you'd figure everybody would just rejoice and celebrate and be awe. But you always have the analytical mind in the room and you always have the skeptical among you. And so they begin to ask questions and begin to ponder and, and the Pharisees and religious leaders begin to ask in verse 26, what did he do to open your eyes? The people analyzed the miracle because it did not make sense. If it made sense, we go around and see any blind person, we spit on their eyes and everything be okay. But that's not typically how a blind man is healed. And we can do everything we can to try to make sense because we like things to make sense. We like to lean on our own understanding. We like to be able to uh, comprehend everything that is set before us. But there's just some things that do not make sense. Sometimes it just simply is. Anyone here have parents? Anybody are parents? Man, when I was when I was younger and I had a a two parents, mom, dad, blessed, thank God for them, but they had these things called rules. And they would so frustrate me and aggravate me because I had other friends that had other kinds of parents and those parents had virtually no rules. In fact, it seemed to be that the child, the teen, the toddler ruled and ran the house. But that wasn't the way it was in our house. You know, when I, I was born and raised in Southside Chicago in the suburbs, and I wasn't in the, the hood, but it wasn't too far from the hood. And we, we had some, our church was in the hood. We had people get shot in our church. It was pretty awesome. And uh, so it kept us in the altar, praying, God, please, not me tonight. But whatever keeps you in the altar, you need that in your life, right? And so we... Um, we weren't allowed to just kind of run the streets and do what we want. And so i say, hey, Mom, Dad, can I go out and hang out with my friends? And they would say no. I'm like, come on, my, my, my friends, they're going out. They're going to be out till 2 in the morning. Can I go out? No, you got to, you know, my Mexican mama from Tijuana, God bless her. She's like, I mean, oh, you need to be home by 8 o'clock. I was like, Mommy, maybe you're not understanding my English. Let me help you out here. Let me, let my friends are, my amigos, they're outside. They're having fun. Everything's okay. It's going to be all right. No, 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 mijo, no, mijo. I'm like, come on, please, Mom, please. I just, I just want to go. And we would have this back and forth battle. And I would just get so mad. I would say, why? And then she would say, I said, no. I go, why? Why can't I go? Mijo, I said, no. No, why? Why? And she would say, because I I thought my mom was the only one who cussed. It was the worst phrase you could ever hear as a child in the home. Because I said so. No expounding, no dissertation, no explanation, no bullet point, you know, presentation. Because I said so. And oh, I would get so mad. It would just cause my blood pressure to rise. And, and when she said, I made a vow under the Lord, God, if I ever grow up, if I ever have children, I will never utter that phrase. Three children later. My children have these parasites called grandparents. Our houses ran perfect. But when my wife and I are away and we have to compromise and give them to these parasites, these grandparents, who basically went back on everything they ever taught me kind of thing, and begin to lavish my children with Snicker bars and Reese's and Mountain Dew, so my wife, she's a little more on the organic side. You know, organic rhymes with satanic. I think that's kind of, I don't know, interesting. But everything's about health. Like you won't ever find soda in the fridge. You're not going to find piles of candy. Like everything's all healthy in our home. And I thank God for it. 
because my wife's here. <laughs> but when they're at grandma and grandpa's, they just stuff them with junk and then drop them off at our house before bed. <laughs> Even worse, just before dinner. And my wife has organic carrots, grass-fed cow, organic potatoes from Ireland itself. And we present this beautiful display of broccoli and cauliflower before my children. I don't want it. Well, you got to eat it. I don't want it. You got to eat. I want candy. You can't have candy. I want candy. You got to eat this right now. No candy. I want candy. And on the, why, why do I got to eat this? And we go back and forth, back and forth. No. Why? Why? No. No. Why? Because I s- I've had to repent a thousand times because that generational curse word has flown into my family. Now I use it. You know what the truth of the matter is? When your two-year-old's talking back to you, you can sit there and give this beautiful presentation with every scientific evidence and proof of the effects of sugar upon your blood and the effects of this sugar upon your teeth. You can talk about calorie. You could talk about cholesterol. You could talk about all those things, and you're right the entire time. But it's to no avail because they are not at a stage to understand and to comprehend. Sometimes you just got to be a parent and say, look, I could tell you if I wanted to, but you're not at the stage to understand. You just need to trust that I am the father, you are the son, and you need to hear me right now because I... See, it's not that different in the word of God and in our spiritual walk with God because moments occur in our life and we're saying, God, why? God, I don't understand. Explain to me, God. Tell me, God, why is this? Am I not a good person? Isn't everything good in my life? Why am I going through what I'm going Tell me why. There was a man named Job that kind of got that spirit on him, and he was a just man. He was a good man. He was a holy man. And yet he had the question, why, go through his mind. And he began to ask over and over again. And God said, fine, you want to know, where were you when I laid the foundation of the world? And where were you when I told the seas they could only come this far? Where were you when I called the angels by name? Where were you? when I numbered the stars. Job slowed his roll and he realized God is God and I am not. He learned a valuable lesson of having to trust in the Lord and not lean on his own understanding. Some things in God's word We may not understand until the other side. On that sweet by and by on the other side of glory. I'm not saying that we need to live life ignorant. Glean and gain as much as you can, but there's some things you will never understand. Spitting in man's face by God is not a one-time occasion. Happens two more times in your Bible in the New Testament. Mark chapter 7, verse 31 through 35. And again, departing from the coast of Tyre and Sidon, he came to the Sea of Galilee through the midst of the coast of Decapolis. And they bring to Jesus one that was deaf. He could not hear. Had an impediment in his speech. And they besought Jesus to put his hand upon him. Isn't that like us telling God how to heal? This is how a healing service is supposed to take place. So Jesus had to separate him from the multitude. And look at this. He puts his fingers into his ears. Well, nice to meet you. And he spit. Someone say he spit. And he touched his tongue. He looked up to heaven. He sighed, said, Ephtha, Ephtha, that is, be opened. 
Straightway this man's ears were open, the string of his tongue was loose, and he spake plain. The next chapter, Mark chapter 8, verse 22 through 25, he comes to Bethsaida, and they bring him a blind man that cannot see, and they, they begin to tell Jesus how to heal him, just touch him. And Jesus once more takes this person with the ailment, this blind man, and leads him out of the town, separates him from the people. And look at this. He spit. Someone say he spit. He spit on his eyes. Put his hands upon him. Asked him if he saw. He looks up. He says, I see men as trees walking. He put his hands upon him, his eyes, and he looked up, and he was restored and saw every man clearly. As I mentioned earlier, I put myself into the story to try to let the thought, the reality of what occurred register. It helps me personally. And you take these two individuals, a deaf man and a blind man. Can you help me? You come on up here. I'm ready. You look shorter from over there. <laughs> And then I get a guy with like a deep voice. I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> well, I'm a real boy. <laughs> yeah. You're going to be the deaf man, and then you're going to be the blind man. Okay, or you stand right here. Right, right there. This, this first guy that we read out, Mark 7, and the second guy, Mark 8, he's going to represent. And one of the men was deaf. He could not hear. Can you hear me? He can't hear. But he can see. And so Jesus, when he begins to work the miracle, he can see Jesus doing this. But he can't hear. Let me just time out. If that offends you, that's how I hear Jesus spitting. I, I just, I struggle with Jesus doing this. He was a carpenter, okay? He was a man, a construction worker. He spit with authority. <laughs> just allow me that, okay? So he can see Jesus, but he can't hear the... And in his mind, what is going through this man's mind? What? It sure looks like Jesus is. Yep. That? No. Is he really? Did that just come out of his mouth? This is the Messiah. This is the Son of God, the Lamb that was slain. Oh. He just spit on him. Could you imagine being that guy? If that's not just that, he put his fingers in his ear. Can you imagine? I don't, I don't know who's a guest here, who's not a guest. Can you imagine your first service here? And they ask, does anyone need a healing? And you're, and you're nervous enough as it is because it's your first time. You don't know who these crazy people are. And you're like, and by faith, you, you step forward. And you're nervous already. And all of a sudden, And he grabs his tongue. And it's like, what in the world is going on? I, I heard Jesus is powerful, but I didn't know he was slain. This is in your Bible. I'm not, I'm not making any of that up. We just read it in the book. Imagine. Do we understand any of that? Why did he put his fingers in his ear? Why did he grab his tongue? Why did he spit up? Why? It doesn't make sense. And then the other guy, he's blind. He can't see. Can you see? I need a. Close your eyes. Don't look. Can you see? He didn't know how close he was to death. can't see right but you can hear because that's how it works and this guy cannot see Jesus doing this 
that he can hear. <laughs> can you, what's going through his, what in the world? Jesus, is there a camel around here? <laughs> and all of a sudden he hears the release. <laughs> and he's like, it sure sounds like someone spit. Can you, what is going through his head when he hears, <laughs> and then, <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, like, oh. I'm, I'm, I promise I, I'm vaccinated, you know, I'm. I can see. <laughs> you can be seated. This just happened in what we read. How would you fare in a situation where you come to the house of God and things don't turn out the way you would like them? Because we have our preconceived ideas how Jesus is supposed to heal, how the miraculous should be performed. And, you know, it's got to be a certain hand palm on the forehead and, you know, cock to the left and then to the right and, you know, and shake a little bit and scream a little bit. We, we like it all done our particular manner and way. But our ways are not God's ways. His ways are higher than ours. And sometimes they're just simply beyond ever finding out. Look. That man that had spit on his eyes, Jesus asked if he saw, and he goes, I, I, I really, I can't see clearly. It didn't even work the first time, so it seemed. You, you could have been disgusted and upset and like, oh, that's disgusting, and storm out. But here's the moral of the story. Everybody that remained and stayed were able to walk away with their miracle. They were able to get the answer that they needed. Sometimes we come to the house of God and they pray for you to be healed and you don't get healed that service. You pray to get the Holy Ghost, you don't get the Holy Ghost that service. And you can walk away mad, bothered, and upset. But I promise you the best thing you can do is come back next Sunday. Come back next Bible study. Come to the altar. Pray. Continue. For everyone that continued seeking God and stayed in the presence of God, receive their miracle. How would you do? How would you do? We have high faith moments, and we have high faith in God. We would think, I would never doubt God. John the Baptist turned his whole ministry, thousands, whole towns coming out to see and hear him preach. And Jesus came and said, follow him. I decrease, he increases, follow him. His whole following begins to go after Jesus. Because he's the Messiah. He saw the confirmation. He saw the clouds open. He heard the voice. He saw the dove. He, he had everything he needed to know confirming that Jesus was the Messiah. But now he's in a prison, about to get executed. He questions what he heard. He questions what he saw. And he gets two of his disciples, and he says, I need you to go talk to Jesus for me. I don't get it. Can you go get him? I want you to ask him, are you he? Are you really the Messiah? Or am I supposed to be looking for another? And so they find him in Matthew chapter 11, those disciples, and they ask Jesus what John asked. And Jesus says, tell John what you saw, that the blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk, the poor have the gospel preached to them. And as those disciples go to report what they've seen and heard, Jesus says before they depart from his presence in verse 6. And by the way, can you tell John this for me? Blessed is he. Whosoever shall not be offended in me. You've seen a lot, church. You've heard a lot, church. But no matter high level of faith that you have in this moment, the day will come in your dungeon, in your prison, in your trial, you're going to wonder, you're going to question what you've seen, you're going to question what you heard. And God brought you here today to say, blessed is the person that is not offended in me. Not everything Jesus says is easy to understand or a joy to take. In John chapter 6, he has arguably his largest gathering ever. 
And as he's in this mass multitude of people, the sea of faces, he says some hard sayings in verse 60. And the disciples, his very own disciples, said, Jesus, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? And Jesus turns to him in verse 61 and says, does this offend you? In fact, in the closing of Jesus' ministry, as he's getting ready, you know, in the communion and in the prayer in the garden, he says in Matthew chapter 26, verse 31, he tells his disciples, you shall be offended because of me. Not your neighbor, not your pastor, God. God has the ability to affect you in such a way where your flesh is offended by him. You know what offended the disciples? The plan of salvation. What's the plan of salvation? The death, the burial, the resurrection. Typically, it seems to be the thing that still offends Christianity to today. Not everybody likes the death, repentance, the burial, baptism in Jesus' name, and the resurrection, the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Many people walk away when it doesn't quite register with their flesh. Offense comes, but everybody who stayed in God's presence walked away with their miracle. They were healed. I want us to take a second look at this blind man. <coughs> Hear me, church. When God spits on your face, <coughs> it is not to insult you. It's for a miracle to inhabit you. God's not trying to hurt you. God's trying to heal you. You got to let the master hand on your life. The fear of a wounded animal is to pull away from the very person that's trying to help them. In your most fearful moments, you, you've got to be still and know this. He is God. He is God. He is God. In John chapter 9, I wanted to revisit this story of this blind man we talked about. In verse 1, Jesus passed by, and he sees this blind man from his birth. They asked Jesus, who sinned this man or his parents that he is born blind? Jesus answered, neither has this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Your lot in life is not to wreck you, it is to raise you. Yes. Your story is for his glory. Yes, God is the only reason you're going through what you're going through. You can point your fingers at anybody and everybody you want, but if you can just place your life in the master's hand, your story will be unto the glory of God. What the enemy meant for evil, God will use it for good. Not all things are good, but all things work together for good to those who love. Am I talking to somebody that loves God right now? Things may not seem to be working out, but I promise you this. There is a God who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or even think. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Look at John chapter 9 here. Mm. In verse 10, they said to this blind man, how were your eyes opened? And so he speaks up. He says, a man that is called Jesus. Can you put that verse on the screen? Leave it up there, please. A man that is called Jesus. Look at the scripture. A man that is called Jesus made clay, and he spit on my eyes. Is that what it says? A man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes. This man could have easily been offended by Jesus spitting. But when asked, the man never even brought it up. Fact check me. Read the verses before and the verses after. Not one mention of spitting. See, it's all about having the right perspective 
an attitude. Are you ready, church? Hear me. You have two choices. Get offended or get anointed. It's up to you. Because God is right where you're at right now, even though you may not see him. You can look to the north, you can look to the west and the east, and you're not sure where he is. But God knows the way that you take. And you can get offended in your situation, or you can get anointed in your situation. I don't like the feel of spit on my face. I don't like the feel of pain and hurt and a sting. But God is refining you so you can come out as fine and pure as gold. You might be going through something gory and horrible, but I promise you this, that God wants to perfect that which concerns you. Come on, church, do you want to get offended or do you want to get anointed? Is there someone in this room that wants the anointing of God on your life? Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hear me, the Holy Ghost is wanting to help you. The Holy Ghost is wanting to help you. Church, we're not taught if you get offended. We're talking about when you're going to get offended. You got a great, you can be seated. I, I know you're ready to charge these altars, but there's just, just some instruction I still need to give here. But I love it. Keep charging the altar. God has blessed this congregation with a man and woman of God. And if your pastor, pastors, like anything he evangelizes when he used to be an evangelist, preaching to thousands of people, preaching to tens of people, doesn't matter, he preached the same. Home slice spits. He got You're sitting there with your umbrella like. See, <laughs> preach like that here. Oh, yeah. Here's some advice. Don't bring an umbrella. Bring a bucket. Lay it on me, pastor. Lay it on me, pastor. So you can misinterpret the man of God preaching as some angry, bigoted jerk trying to be a dictator. Or you can understand that he is the vessel of God, the channel that Lord is working through. And what's flowing through that man of God is word. What's flowing through that man of God is anointing. Don't get offended. Get anointed. The preaching of the word. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word. And how can we hear without a preacher? It may not be your style. It may not be your preference. It's not about your style. It's not about your preference. It's about being yielded and surrendered, saying, God, I don't understand the delivery, but I know the word's going to deliver me. I know the word's going to do something for me. So let the word hit me right between the eyes stage a pastor in this church give it time give it time I'm not trying to scare you but you're going to get offended you know why because you're human you're human and you're going to get offended in the house of God by the God of the house you will get offended by the man of God appointed by God, you will get offended even by the person you're sitting next to right now you will get offended who knows when the doors open here and someone brings your kid in? Hey, hey, I'm sorry. Um, Johnny's just acting up a little bit, okay? Can you just, he's got to stay in the sanctuary. He's causing division. How dare you? Not my little Johnny. He's an angel. Yeah. 
Rule number one to kids, trust none of them. They got sent in this sanctuary for a reason, and they're lying through their teeth. Mommy, no. They, I don't understand why she put me in the sanctuary. I did nothing. Your little Lucy is Lucy Fur. <laughs> Just saying. And now your blood is boiling. And instead of being a parent, receiving instruction, so you have the ability to give instruction, you can't give what you don't have. If you don't know how to receive instruction, you have no authority to give your children instruction. Now you're mad at the Sunday school teacher. You start talking to other people. I don't, I don't know why Sister Bertha is the Sunday superintendent school leader bishopess. I, I just don't understand. You're all mad and ticked off and burning. And you start just uh, have all these things to say. And you don't even realize that Sunday school teacher that you're so mad at. They did everything in their power to keep your kid involved. And they did everything they could. They're, they're not paid for their position. They're pulling money out of their own pocket to buy snacks. They're the ones that are waking up early. Why, you came to church 15 minutes late. They were at this church 15 hours ago praying and seeking the face of God and putting their plan together and saying, God, I pray somebody in this room would be, Lord, receiving this message today. I pray for Susie. I pray for Lucy. I pray for Johnny. They did everything they could to pour into your child. Well, how come I'm not on the worship team? Why wasn't I picked to be like worship leader? Dude, this church bites. I knew he wasn't anointed. He couldn't even... Psh. Petty things. Trivial things. Why'd they buy that size monitor? Could have saved money if they would have went with the 12-inch. <laughs> I don't think I want to tithe here. Petty things little things so easily it can creep into our spirit without even realizing it things that happen when you don't understand what pastor preaches be careful you know my i have a mexican mama from tijuana she went to prison for attempted manslaughter they don't mess with her i've done many sombrero dances she still got it she got the holy ghost but she still got some of the past. <laughs> They've had some tempers, but I've never, I've never in my life heard my parents speak a negative word about the church. When I was in that home, I'd never heard them say anything negative about the pastor. I guarantee you there's some disagreements. I guarantee you there's some things they didn't like, but they wanted to cover us and protect us. I, I remember, you know, we, we pastored for 15 years, church plant in South Dakota, south of the North Pole. You don't know where it's at. Negative 40, beautiful place. And we started in a house church. We slept in the basement. We had church upstairs. We had nothing. We were, we, were, we were poor. The kind of poor where you eat cereal at forks just to save milk kind of poor. Am I going too fast? And so we did everything we could to save money. And I remember our first convert that we baptized in Jesus' name. You know, we, we didn't have a baptistry. We had this horse trough, and we found the spigot. It was in the middle of winter. I think it was January. It was cold. And I turned on the faucets, so water would go in, and it was like spitting out ice chunks. It was like an ice machine. It's like, man, we can't deep freeze her in Jesus' name. And uh, so I got up at 5 in the morning and went to the basement and got all the pots and pans I could, boiled water from 5 a.m. to 10 a.m., and just did bucket after bucket because I really believed this thing. 
And so when she came in, like, you know, the, the horse trough had, like, steam coming up from it. We're going we're gonna to steep her in Jesus' name. It was a powerful conversion. And eventually it took, it took years before we got her entire family. Her family, after years, was the first complete family unit, husband, wife, children. And it was a, a huge victory. But we got tired of baptizing people in a trough. We wanted to get some nice ones, so we raised some money and funds. And the way to do it is I was making peanut brittle. And uh, that's what you do when you get trapped in the basement in South Dakota in the winter. You just make peanut brittle. And I, I was making so much peanut brittle, brittle round the clock. I was turning orange, and before orange was a presidency color, I was so orange with peanut brittle, I smelled, and I, I, I laid across the altar. I was so excited when I made them all. Laid them across the aisle, peanut brittle. You Couldn't you imagine your altar filled with peanut brittle? So we could raise funds. And so as I was doing this, and I was telling the church about it, that sister got mad. She, she, she left service angry. I was like, what in the world's wrong? So I called her. I was like, hey, everything okay? She said, you're trying to kill my kids. What? You're trying to kill my kids. What do you, what do you mean I'm trying to kill your kids? They're allergic to peanuts. I never even heard of such a thing. Allergic to peanuts? That's horrible. Reasons? Horrible. But my wife and I, we went on the rebound, made the most beautiful, immaculate gift basket for her children. I went to the house, knocked on the door, no one answered. And in South Dakota, you leave your doors unlocked, so I just walked in. And I, I, I put the gift basket there, and I closed it, and I headed out. Sometime later, I get a phone call. It's her. And I'm like, it's going to be like rebound of the year. I could hear it right now. Pastor, you're like the bomb.com. <laughs> and so I answer it. Hello? You're trying to kill my kids. Did you get the gift basket? Yes. What's what, everything okay? No, you put Butterfingers in there. I didn't know this, but Butterfingers have peanut butter in them. I know now. <laughs> they left the church. A couple years later, I get a phone call. It's the husband. I'm at camp, and I answer. I, I, get, I haven't talked to him in years. I'm like, hello, are you doing okay? He's like, I'm so glad you answered the phone. I was like, what's going on? He's like, I'm in front of someone's house. I got a gun. I'm about to kill him. My wife's having an affair. And I go, I need you, I need you to calm down, put, put the gun away. I want you to think about your children. I want you to think about the future. I had to walk the man off the cliff or away from the cliff. Going back to something so petty and insignificant, obviously there was deeper issues. When you start getting offended by the petty, that is the fruit of something deep inside of you. When you come to church and every little thing is bothering you, no matter what he says, it's not good enough, it's not anointed enough, there's something in there. I'm not coming to beat you up. I'm not coming to rebuke. I'm coming to try to help. I tell you, I have a healing word in the Holy Ghost for you today. There is a root in there that's so deep that you may not even be able to recall what it is. But there is a God here that says, look, if you would just stay here right now, I can uproot that root of bitterness and I can heal. two brothers and a sister my older brother I was anytime I have a carnal story it's when I was not in the church it's BC before COVID Bishop got it I was in high school my brother went to Bible college before he went to Bible college he started dating a girl in the church he was in the church I wasn't I was a backslider. <clears throat> man, I was like, man, 
good looking girl. She went to Bible college with him. And he's all Twitter pated. Comes back home. He's he's feeling like he's gonna propose to her. He's on his break from college. And uh he's heading out of the house, like, where are you going? He goes, I'm gonna go see Pastor. I'm like, oh, right on, have, have fun. So they went and they uh, he went to pastor's office. But when he came back later, his footsteps weren't the same. They were heavy on the steps. I knew something was off. So I go to him, I go, everything's okay? Yeah, I just got back from pastor's office. What'd he say? He wants me to break up with my girlfriend. What? She's hot. What's wrong with her? He didn't really say. He said he felt, what's the will of God? What are you going to do? I'm going to listen to pastor. Next semester, she goes back, he goes back, not dating. They found that girl in a room with another man. I'll leave it at that. What if my brother got offended. He started a church 18 years ago in a house. Revival church is thriving. Next week, I'm preaching their brand new building dedication. He, he, he served the district. He served as a youth president in Illinois. He serves as the presbyter in Illinois. He preaches and pastors a powerful church. But one offense could have undid everything. Everything. I promise you this. Your pastor is not trying to micromanage you, not trying to be dictated of your life. I'll tell you why you're, st- when you're at home so ticked off after the sermon that he preaches, what you didn't. See, here's how you may think your pastor is on Saturday night. <laughs> oh, I got a hot sermon. Gonna get him right between the eyes. Sister Shanene, I'm gonna let her have it. This sermon I'm crafting only for her. And I'm gonna. <laughs> but you know what your pastor's really doing? God, I plead your blood. I pray for her. I pray for her husband. I pray for her children. God, I believe that their son is going to be the next pastor of this church. God, I want to see great things for them. I love them. God, I pray for sister so-and-so. I pray for brother so-and-so. God, I want to see them thrive. I want to see their children, Lord, go to heaven. I want to see their marriage do awesome. God, that's what your pastor is doing. It's what you don't see that you got to help see in your mind's eye, that you have a shepherd that is watching over you your soul and he's doing it with fear and trembling and love he is saying God when I step into that pulpit I want to minister my goal is not to offend people Lord I want to anoint people I want them God to reach their full potential in the name Ha, I've been preaching an hour. You could stand. Mm. The Bible says in Proverbs 18, 19, a brother offended is harder to be won. A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city. And their contentions are like the bars of a castle. I don't know everything about this church. But from the decades that Bishop has pastored here and even the two, three years that your pastor currently has been here. This wonderful building that you are celebrating that you have come into would not host the people that were part of this church if they would not have left offended this this is such a small building for the amount of people that have come through this church you understand what i'm saying and right now in your mind it's playing you're thinking about all 
the people that come through here. And you be careful before you start trying to blame other people in this room by that person leaving. No, that was just the fruit of something deeper. No, uh, it's escaping. The name of the man that fell out of the window in the book of Acts. Somebody help me. Eutychus? Does anyone know their Bible? No. But I like that. It sounds good. I want to say it's Eutychus. Whatever he is. The boy that was in that window and he fell out because the preacher was preaching law. Look, nobody pushed the boy out the window. He fell the direction he was leaning. So don't. Don't try to blame the church for anybody that left this place. They went the direction they were leaning. And you don't want to find yourself leaning that same direction because this is a good house. Let me tell you something about forgiveness, and I, I promise I'm trying to wrap up right now. I mean, I, got, I could preach another half hour easily. It's pathetic. But I remember my wife and I had, had some issues, health issues. My wife had this big old cyst on her wrist, and... I, I thought I had cancer. I had some significant issues. I was pretty nervous about it, but we didn't have any money to go to the hospital, so we just didn't go. But I was at a table with preachers, and an elder was there, Brian Kinsey. As we're sitting there, I was just asking some questions about the miraculous and faith, because I, I, I want to walk in that world. I want to see the supernatural. I want to see healings. And I was just asking about times I, I don't understand where it seems I could perceive the person has faith and I have faith and I pray for them to receive that miracle and they do not receive it. And he just said, you know, sometimes it's a spirit of infirmity. And when he said that, it's like I had an out-of-body experience at that table. And God began to play just things like a movie reel through my mind. And he's talking, everything around me, boom, 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 boom. And I'm like having this moment in my chair at the table. And God shows me this individual. God says, you have a spirit of infirmity. I'm like, what do you mean? And he shows me this individual, this pastor, this minister that caused me lots of problems. I'm like, but God, I forgave him. I told him. I forgave him. I told him I am sorry. And this movie reel is playing. He goes, and I, and I, I this, this is honest. I said, I'm sorry to him. I apologize. And I begin to even send money to him. Because the Bible says a gift in secret pacifieth anger. When their children had problems, I sent gifts to their children to just let them know I loved them. But God says, you haven't forgiven him. What do you mean? He says, you talk to people about what he did to you. And when you rehearse your hurt, that's not forgiveness. You want him to look bad and you to look good. And in that moment, I resolved, I will never mention his name of what he did to me ever again. And the moment that happened, I felt virtue flow through my body. And I picked up my phone and I called my wife and I told her. I said, babe, everything I just told you, she's like, we're healed. Her cyst went away. My problem went away. You may be praying for some things to happen, but I could it be there's a spirit of infirmity called unforgiveness inside of you? And until you forgive, you cannot be forgiven. God will not heal because you'll take it as consent to your lifestyle when not everything in your life is godly. We want God to forgive us, but God wants us to forgive them. And he says, if you don't forgive them, I won't forgive you. That's what Jesus said. So powerful is this concept of forgiveness. The Bible says that whoever sins you remit, they're remitted, but whoever sins you retain are retained. Now, Catholics will jump on that and use it for, like, confessional booth. That's not what that means. It's saying what you have 
You have a message that's able to be released to somebody and their sins can be remitted. But if you retain it, it's retained. So when you retain forgiveness, you will not release forgiveness to somebody. What kind of revival is this church going to have? The proportion of your revival is going to be the level of forgiveness you're willing to release. If you can release forgiveness, there is a revival because people cannot be forgiven by the unforgiven. We have to forgive. We have to release. We have to let it go. Church, I'm talking about when God spits in your face. And if you can hear this message here today, I promise you there is a revival. God will release forgiveness through this city. God will release forgiveness through this community. But forgiveness has to flow freely in this room. This has to be a vessel of forgiveness and mercy this has to be a house of mercy this has to be a house of grace this has to be a house of forgiveness come on in the name of Jesus we cannot give what we do not have in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ Lord it says in Psalm 119 verse 165 great peace have they that love thy law nothing shall offend them Why does the anointing matter? It says in Isaiah 10, 27, the yoke is destroyed because of the anointing. Yo anointing destroys yokes. Offense builds them. Do you want to get offended or anointed? If you're here right now and there's this, God's pr prompting something in your mind that you need to release. It could be an uncle that molested you. It could be a father that walked out on you. It could be something the pastor preached. It could be something someone in this room did to you. I can assure you this statistically, 90% of the time, what they did was unintentional to harm you. You just have a damaged filter that God wants to heal today. Does anyone need healing in this room? Because I'm telling you the Holy Ghost healing is here right now. If you would step forward by faith and just humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and lift your hands and say, God, I don't want to live offended. I want to live anointed. Come on, would you lift your voice right now? I don't, I don't have much energy to raise my voice right now. Can you, can you raise your voice in the Holy Ghost right now? Come on, you're, if you're a licensed minister in this room, if you're a minister of the gospel, it's easy for ministry to get offended by other ministry. It's other for min, easy for ministry to get offended by people who mistreated your family or things didn't turn out the way you wanted them. Come on, whatever status you are, whatever walk of life that you're in, there needs to be a release of forgiveness in this house right now. Come on, don't get offended. Get anointed. Come on, get anointed right now. And when you get anointed, you will have the authority to destroy the yoke that is weighing on you. When you get anointed, you will be able to see clearly for the first time. Come on, you don't have to be blind anymore. You don't have to be deaf anymore. God wants you to see clearly. God wants you to hear clearly right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, that's it. Come on, let the tears fall. That's healing. That's, let the tears fall. That's anointing. Let the voice out. That's healing. That's anointing. You got nothing to be ashamed of right now. You got nothing to be embarrassed of right now crying. We are all praying together right now as a church. We are weeping together as a church. We are crying together as a church. We are confessing together as a church. We are all human. We all make mistakes. We all get offended. We all get hurt. But there is a God who can reach every single person in this room right now because he loves you. Jesus loves you. Jesus will forgive you. You've just got to forgive someone else. Forgive your brother. Forgive your sister. Forgive your pastor. 
Forgive your youth pastor. Come on, forgive whoever it is. Forgive your husband. Forgive your, your husband hurt you bad. Come on, he, he, he made you lose trust in him. But you got to forgive if you want there to be healing. You've got to forgive if you want there to be healing. In the name of Jesus, come on, your son has let you down. You didn't think your son would ever do such a thing. But would you forgive him right now? Would you love him right now? Come on, let the love of God flow through you. Let the peace of God flow through you. Let the mercy of God flow through you. Come on, open up that valve and release the sound. You got to release the pressure that's been building up on you right now. There's been so much pressure for so many years. Come that hurt has haunted you for decades. Come on, you've repressed that memory. God is trying to open it back up so he can heal it. Come on, come on in the name of Jesus. Come on, what they did to you was wrong. It wasn't right. But what they did to Jesus wasn't right either. But he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. There's power on the day you say that. There's power on the day you pray that. Father, forgive them. I forgive them. Lord Jesus, you have given us the ministry of reconciliation. Come on, God's given you the ministry of reconciliation. Come on, reconcile those wrongs. Reconcile those wrongs in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not by my might and not by my power, but by the Spirit of the living God. Come on, there should be intercession in this room right now. Come on, church. Come on, church, help create an atmosphere. Come on, create an atmosphere where there can be release in this room right now. There's some real burdens on this altar tonight. There's some real burdens in this altar. Come on, in the name of Jesus, forgive. Forgive and it shall be given. Forgive and it shall be given. Come on, the same measure you give, God's going to measure it back to you. Press down, shaking together and running over. Giving's not just about money. Come on, there's a spirit of giving. Would you would you give forgiveness? Would you give mercy to somebody right now? Would you give a pardon to somebody right now? And God's going to give back unto you, to your heart, to your bosom. God's going to give back to you, pressed down, shaken together. There's going to be an overflow in your spirit right now in the name of Jesus. I speak to the spirit of infirmity right now. Lord, as they confess and as they forgive, I pray a release of virtue in this room. I pray a release of healing in this house right now. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. That's it. Let it flow. Let it flow. Let it flow. That's it. Let it flow. Let it flow. Ah, come on, there's freedom in this house. That's liberty you haven't felt in years. Walk in liberty. Walk in liberty. Come on, enjoy it. Enjoy forgiveness. Enjoy mercy. Enjoy grace. I will not be offended. I'm going to be anointed. I will not be offended. I'm going to be anointed. God's raising an anointed church right now. God is raising an anointed church right now. The gates of hell will not prevail against a church that's anointed. It cannot win against a church that has forgiveness. It cannot win against the message of grace. It cannot win against the message of mercy. Every morning, let it be new. Every morning, let it be new.
That's it. Come on, church. Oh, let's let it out a little more. Come on, you haven't wept like this in a while. Oh, you haven't brought up this topic in a long time. That's it. Lay it at the altar of God. Be transparent before Jesus. Be open. Be honest before Jesus. That's what he wants right now is a humble, contrite heart. Hey, de mondombre, rame, roli, ra, re, ya, ra, ma. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Haramo to 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 basa ta 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 ka ta 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 ta. Be to to bre kara be ro to ro ko ro be ara. Mero bo to ramara la re. Moro ro 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 ko ro 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 that's it, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost. Say, man, break, come, bro, some, break, re, man, de, ala, le, yo, lo, ro, ro, ma, ha. Oh, lo, lo, ro, 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 I feel a release in the atmosphere. Come on, if you have forgiven, would you stand to your feet anointed? Would you stand to your feet anointed right now? And let's destroy some yokes with authority. Come on, you got authority to destroy a yoke right now. Where there's an anointing on you, there's an authority on you. Go ahead and destroy that yoke that has bound your family. Go ahead and destroy that yoke that has bound your spirit. Go ahead and destroy that yoke that has put an infirmity on you. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I declare it right now. That Thou art loose. We take authority in Jesus' name, for we do not lift our voice in offense. We lift our voice in anointing right now, and we destroy every yoke. We cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. I bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Let there be a roar of victory. Let there be a roar of victory. There's healing. There's victory. There's joy. I want you to start offering up thanksgiving. Offer up thanksgiving right now. Come on, this is the acceptable will of God. Come on, in the name of Jesus, thanks God. Thank you for talking to me. Thank you for healing me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for virtue. Thank you for release. Thank you, come on, thank him right now. Say it audibly. Use that word if you gotta say it a hundred times over. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, 
Let's clap our hands to the Lord. Let's thank him one more time. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Ah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. When you're a child, you don't totally understand and register everything that's going on. But I have a very vivid memory of one service after church. We were driving, and the drive took longer than it usually did to get to church or get home from church. It's usually basically a 10 to 12-minute drive. But all of a sudden, 12 turned into 20, closer to 30. I'm like, what in the world's going on? And we pulled up in front of a house I'd never seen in my life. And my dad walked out to that house and knocked on the door. He opened that door. The look on this elderly man's face was shock. And then my father hugged that elderly man, who I discovered to be my grandfather. An adult's offense, if not dealt with, will bleed into generations. But that day, I began to build a relationship with my grandfather. Because my father forgave. As I walk away from this pulpit, another story that comes to my mind, I keep going over stories I like to talk. But there was two men that I know personally, and one of them is responsible for me going to South Dakota. Both are from South Dakota, both brothers on a farm. Both went to the same church. Both had children. But one of the brothers got offended, and the other stayed. But the one that got offended and walked away from attending that church still claimed he believed everything, but he just did not attend church. One of his kids committed suicide. The other two backslid. On the other side of that coin, the other brother that stayed, all three kids serving the Lord in the ministry. Parent, grandparent, don't get offended. Get anointed. If you're determined to be anointed, clap your hands as your pastor comes. I love you. Thank you, Jesus. Let's do that to the Lord just for another few moments. Thank you for this word, Jesus. Thank you for this word, Jesus. Thank you for this word, Jesus. I feel like some messages you come, you have good church, and you go home and you talk about good church. But I feel like today for someone was a service you're never going to forget. You're never going to forget it because of what God spoke to you and what God did to you. It's interesting. I've never seen this before, Brother Mark. And while he was preaching, the Holy Ghost is speaking to me about the, the, the spit and the anointing. They're equivalent. It's spit and it's anointing. And, and it's interesting that when you look at the Beatitudes, these are cumulative Beatitudes. It starts with, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are they who mourn. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Blessed are the peacemakers. So you got to get the previous level to get the next blessing. And then you get that level, and then you get to the next level of blessing. The highest level of blessing from God comes when men shall revile you and say things against you falsely and speak evil of you. That's even above being physically persecuted. If you can get through offense, there's a higher level of blessing for you than if you were physically hurt for the kingdom of God. That's the highest level. 
And what, what Brother Brown said is it's not if you're going to get offended. This is a beautiful church, the ch church family. These are some of the sweetest people, nicest people. But you're still going to get offended by somebody. <laughs> There's still going to be a day when somebody gives you a wrong look, a wrong word, or even does something worse to you. And, and you're going to have to decide, is that going to lodge in my spirit? I, I know what this man's talking about. Because I used to be easily offended. Deeply. I could hold a grudge like a bulldog holding a bone. You ain't taking it. It's my grudge. I could be mad at people. I'm talking some people. I was mad at them for years. And, and this, is, this is a message reminding me, hey, you better make sure. Anybody remember what Sister Varnum said? The first time they came, right after we started pastor, she walked up to the pulpit. Anybody remember what she said, the words out of her mouth? She said, make sure you don't get offended. What does that mean? That means when offenses come, forgive them. Pray through it because that spit is going to be your anointing for healing and deliverance. My Lord. My Lord, what a word from God. What a word from God. Let's just thank him one more time for this word. Thank you that your word is not just a sermon, but it's a delivering power that can come into our minds and spirits and set us free in a way counseling couldn't and, and drugs couldn't and alcohol couldn't. It can set our minds and our spirits and our emotions free. Thank you for this word. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Brother Brown, for being led of the Holy Ghost and preaching to us today. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. We have a baptism right after the service. The water is warmed up. It's like a hot tub in there. We have robes. If you've never been baptized in Jesus' name, one way to bury that past, one way to get rid of that guilt, one way to get rid of that shame, is to get baptized in Jesus' name. And the water's ready. You take off your dry clothes. You put on the robe. You get in the water. You take, go back in the bathroom, take your robe off, put the dry clothes back on. It's five minutes of inconvenience for an eternity of thankfulness. And uh, that's, there's somebody already getting baptized. If you want to be baptized, just let somebody know, and they'll direct you to the right spot. Any announcements? Don't forget tonight, we have church twice on Sunday. You know, the people you hear clapping are the fanatics in the house. They love as much church as they can get. Why do we have church twice on Sunday? I'll tell you why. It's not because we wouldn't rather go home and rest. We would rather go home and rest in our flesh. Why do we have church? Make sure everybody's listening to me right now, okay? Why do we have church twice on Sunday? Because there are things that happen Sunday night that cannot happen Sunday morning. Why? Because of the level of sacrifice it requires for people to come twice in one day. <laughs> so you come, expect deliverance, expect miracles. God is going to do something mighty. Pre-service prayer at 5.30, 6 o'clock is our service. We love you.